check, check. All right, you guys, I think we are about ready to get started. It looks like it's 3 o'clock, and this is our Monday, March 15th special meeting. Uh, today we're going to be looking at our strategic visioning plan and doing an update. So I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is 3 o'clock on the dot. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Council Member Dinas? Here. Council Member Carwin? Here. Council Member Lise Meyer? Mayor Pro Tem Sobek. I'm here. And Mayor Zimmerman. And I'm here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, stand and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Okay, thank you. So we are uh, we have our plexiglass dividers here, six feet apart. Uh, so we are social distanced. And so if you're comfortable, feel free to remove your face mask. And we're going to go ahead and, um, Madam Clerk, I just wanted to ask: Did we receive any public comments uh, this evening through email? No, we don't have any as of yet. All right, thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and move to our item four. This is our workshop, and uh, I'll turn it over to our city manager uh, to have our staff run through the program today. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Before I start, I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce our newest uh, department director, uh, Ron Puccinelli, and uh, he's going to be ahead of our IT department. So, Ron, if you want to say a couple of words, maybe introduce yourself to the council. IT guy doesn't understand. Yeah. Oh, go the jokes. You, you, you want me to call IT? <laughs> <laughs> He's already set up. How many IT guys does it take to turn on the microphone? Right. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. It's my pleasure to, to become part of the Menifee team. Looking forward to accomplishing a lot and realizing a lot of the vision here. I am coming most recently from the city of Fairfield up in the San Francisco Bay Area. This will be my fourth, I believe, uh, city municipal experience, um, supporting police, fire, and all things related to city. Looking very much forward to, to a long-term uh, working with the team here, and I'm glad to be here. All right, Mr. Puccinelli, welcome aboard. Th thank you, Ron. So now on to the business. M Mayor, if, if you recall, uh, this item is, is, we want to make this item a very interactive very, you know, roll up your sleeves type of a meeting. Uh, this is the time of the year where we get to talk about strategic plan. And the, the importance of that and the timing of it is important for us to extract your vision and what you want us to accomplish uh, throughout the year so that we can roll that into programs and, and then put it into the budget. So what we have, if you recall, in 2008 and 18, uh, we develop a, the city second uh, strategic plan and we folded a lot of the elements of the first plan into the second plan. In that second plan we drew uh, the, the vision of the council at the time and we developed six foundational goals and from there we went out and developed uh, activities and, and programs and as of today we completed approximately 60 percent of the programs that we set out to do. We still have about 40 percent to do we're two, two and a half years into a five-year plan, so I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, we're going to have Imelda Huerta, our, our analyst, go over the, the origins of the plan and then, and then uh, begin to overview some of the outstanding items. And then hopefully we, we can draw from you anything that you would like to see added to the plan to expand on the vision for the city. So with that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. Again, my name is Imelda Huerta, Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office. So it's my pleasure to be here today to um, walk through the Strategic Visioning Workshop for 2021. 
Um, and as Armando mentioned, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So I will be giving a brief background. I know I do at every meeting, just a brief background of how the plan came to be. Um, and then a brief, um, the recent updates that have taken place within the last year since the last uh, workshop. And then we'll be going through each um, category um, or each um, goal area. Um, and I'll pause in between each of those um, in between each section to allow for discussion and recommendations rather than wait all the way till the end to have a dialogue. And again, if you um, have any questions throughout uh, the presentation or um, have need any clarification, please feel free to uh, let me know and I'll, uh, I will pause and we can discuss. Um, so with you in your packet, you should have the agenda packet, um, the PowerPoint, but I also included a worksheet that we'll be working off of. It does say March 2021 workshop sheets in red at the very top. Okay, and so with that, I will give a brief background of the, um, of the plan. Okay, so um, as Armando mentioned, this, the first strategic plan took place in 2012. Um, and in 2018, we did um, implement this uh, current five-year strategic visioning plan. This plan was accomplished through a collaborative effort with city council and staff through several meetings. The vision purpose was to define goals and objectives that align with city's business goals, improve balance between demand for more efficient and available resources, including technology, capital, and operating funds, and to be a roadmap that will help the city close the gap between the current and future needs. Um, and with that being said, we do want to note that this is a live document where we can provide changes uh, throughout the life of the plan. So just uh, some timeline of the plan development. In April, May in 2018, a focus group was convened with representation from various levels of the organization to develop the visioning plan. The group met to discuss internal and external influences affecting the city. And in, later that year, in May 2018, after the focus group completed the review, the management team met for a strategic visioning and implementation retreat. And in July 2018, there was a workshop and the plan was adopted by city council. So there are four um, goals that are uh, adopted in this plan. The first one is a safe and attractive communities. Um, the vision is to provide a full range of services that meet the highest professional and accredited standards of public safety by protecting life, maintaining order, and safeguarding property within our community. A goal two is livable and economically prosperous com uh, community. The vision is to develop mechanisms to foster a robust economy, solid educational opportunities, and jobs. Goal three is responsive and transparent uh, community government. The vision is to foster efficient multimodal communication to inform and educate our community, to develop a clear sense of place and establish our unique identity. And the fourth goal is accessible and interconnected community. The vision is to create and maintain a function functionally appropriate, sustainable, accessible, and high quality infrastructure and facilities. So within those um, four goals, we do have uh, six goal areas or objectives have, as we've referred to them in the past. Um, and that is public safety, land use, city hall, infrastructure, community outreach, workforce, and facilities management. Under these goal areas, there's approximately uh, 35 objectives and a total of 181 current tasks and action items. Some recent updates, um, we did provide a council updates on May 17th, 2019, December 4th, 2019, March 12th, 2020, when we had our last special uh, council meeting workshop. And we recently gave an update to council in January of this year. And at that time, um, we, we noted that 27 tasks were added since the March workshop. And 17 additional tasks were completed between March 2020 to January, and four more have been completed um, since January. So there's a total of, tw of additional 21 tasks that were completed within the last year. Um, just a quick, uh, quick overview. Um, since the last workshop, there were approximately 27 action items and tasks that were added. 
Um, so I just want to go over them real quick. In public safety, we did add the new fire station five objective, and you can see the four tasks that were added, response time assessment, funding strategy, design and, and environmental, and construction. Additionally, we added the fire services citywide uh, needs assessment, and under that is a fire department strategic plan. Under land use, we added uh, a few items under the parks and trails enhanced standards of park system. And under this, we added um, the phase plan for Evans property, the formation of a parks not a related nonprofit, and open space nature preserve conservation effort. Um, and under infrastructure, we did also add quite a few items. The objective that was added, added was a welcome map program. And this was to begin the beautification at the main corridors um, and off on the off ramps. We also added the northern and southern gateway development, the Bradley Bridge over Salt Creek objective, and smart cities for infrastructure. Under community outreach, we did add public recognitions for youth and college students' contributions, which we currently do. It's just been on hold right now due to COVID. Um, we also <coughs> added creating a healthcare medical partnerships, and you can see two of the action items, identify partners, execute MOUs. Um, and we also added the public records, open access, and public transparency objectives with the six noted uh, action items and tasks. Some significant updates that have um, occurred within the last year are as follows. Um, under the public safety objective, the enhanced collection programs under active code enforcement that was completed. Under the aesthetics of the city, the development of design guidelines for commercial buildings that was completed. And under the new fire station five objective, uh, the two noted tasks, response time assessment and funding strategy were also completed. And as, uh, as you know, under the police department formation, um, there were six additional items completed. Um, and as you know, we, the police uh, department did go live July 1st, 2020. Some other significant updates um, under land use were under parks and trails enhanced standards of park system. The, um, the staff did recalibrate the Quimby fee structure and there is an ongoing effort already for open space and nature preserve conservation for open space purchases. Under infrastructure, the Scott Road 215 improvement was completed. Um, staff started the Holland Road overpass project, developing uh, the funding strategy was complete, and staff has identified um, or developed the Menifee Gateway sign program. Under community outreach, under healthcare and medical partnerships, um, staff has identified partners recently, and under the newly added pu public records, open access, and public transparency objective, the following four action items were completed. Easy access online records request, the elections information page, the updated agenda management system has been implemented, as well as the OpenGov public dashboard um, program. As our city manager, uh, mentioned there is a total of 60% of the tasks that have been completed to date or a total of 109 out of the 181 tasks have been completed. Okay, and so now um, I will begin going through each section. Before I do so, do you have any questions regarding the recent updates? Proceed ahead. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, so public safety. Um, the local control contract versus local PD, that's actually been completed. That has been completed, I think, since um, 2019. And out of um, the active code enforcement um, objective, there's been a total of 15 of the 17 tasks that have been completed, so almost done. It, it, this objective is um, anticipated to be completed in June of this year. Some of the key action items that are still pending are revise and update various municipal codes, which um, staff is working on, and the street sweeping enforcement program, which I know the majority is done by the county, um, and I'm not sure if um, Director Jonathan Nix wanted to add anything else on that update.
Are there any questions working? on the <laughs> Oh, IT's coming. Actually, I don't know if there are any uh, direct questions from the city council on this item, just as Ms. Huerta stated. Um, less than 30% of the street sweeping is actually done by the city. Most of it's done by the county through CSA 152. So in order to have a consistent street sweeping program throughout the city, we'd have to go through that annexation process with LAFCO, which is still pending. Jonathan, can you remind us, it <clears throat> seems like at one time we had discussed having a citywide ordinance regarding parking uh, on certain days, and did we put that on hold? The parking had to do with uh, street sweeping days. Yes, that, that's also been on hold because the county is overseeing that area. So we can we can't do that. Uh, there's, there, there's no city signage actually um, within the parking, and also we have to work with the police department on enforcement and the uh, hire staff and assign them to call around call around the street sweeper. But of course, that it's a little bit challenging because we don't provide all the street sweeping in the county. Does. We have to work with them to provide that. Um, in the interim until we annex. So it, it, the cleanest way would be to annex all those areas first, then implement the program. Okay. It, I don't know is, if that's something that you were planning on bringing to the council as something that we do or do not intend to do, again, with the, with the thought of not irritating the public kind of a thing. I, I don't know if the council is behind that or not. Do you plan on bringing that for the, that question first before you get too far along? <laughs> just, just yell. Just yell. We can hear you. That, that, uh, that could be a decision of the council right now. I mean, that is a strategic uh, planning item that was uh, done before. I was the interim public works director. If the council would like to change direction and focus on some other areas, then you could um, do so and give us that question today. Council, how do we feel about creating a no parking on certain days uh, when there's street sweeping? Is that something we think is valuable and we want to do, or is it something to avoid? Anybody have any thoughts on that? So I, I actually had this conversation uh, when I first got on the council and did a little research into it. Um, at the time, we weren't in a place to do that as a city. We didn't have the finances. And then the hiring the person that would have to go behind the street sweeping truck, um, at that time, they I was told that um, what the program would cost um, outweighed what we the benefits would be at that time. So um, I I kind of go I, I kind of agree with um, John that maybe we ought to wait for the annexation, see how our police department's going, get our code up to where it should be, um, and then maybe that's something. If it becomes a nuisance, then we will know because we'll be in charge of the street sweeping, but that's my feeling. It's kind of just hold off on that right now. Other council members feel the same way? So, nope. Jonathan, maybe what we're doing is nope. uh, just waiting for that, like as uh, Mayor Pro Tem said, but please do bring it back to us before we say, all right, we're going to start spending money and doing things. I have uh, Councilman Leesmeyer in the uh, queue. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. I would, I would be a little apprehensive just because um, it would probably just be a program that would continue to, you know, develop more staff, more issues. I'd like to see us get what we have under control. Um, I already see a huge disconnect with some street sweeping. There's a lot of areas that, that don't get done. Um, I know that there's some areas that are annexed, some that are not. Some are part of HOA, some are part of, you know, developers' responsibilities, and, you know, I think it'd be good to get all, a good handle on everything that's going on out there. Um, I do like it from the one aspect that if cars don't get moved, um, it, it kind of brings light to vehicles that are just sitting around on our roadways, um, gets gets the junkers off the streets. That's That, that would be the only attractive part for me right now. Um, aside from what our, our obligations are from a regional water standpoint, I know that Jonathan brought this back I don't know, several years ago and was talking about a regional water control board issue where we need to have our streets cleaned. And um, I'd be curious what Yolanda might have to add about that, but um, I think there's a balance in there somewhere. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Uh, City Manager, did you want to Yes, add? Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to <clears throat> maybe further clarify that the, the, the issue, while it may seem simple, it's, it lays with very complicated procedures. 
Uh, one of the challenges we have is we have uh, sort of a uh, the, uh, issue that uh, a lot of the areas in the city are maintained by what is we know as CSA 152, which is maintained by the county. And but but it, but they not only only cover the city, they cover other portions of the city. So we have to undo that and separate what's in the city from what's in the county. That's going to be a very complicated process. Our hope is to, once we get to that point, and um, actually get LAFCO to undo that and then give us our own area, that we can consolidate the street sweeping program into one contract uh, so that we can have better handle on how we, you know, we uh, program what areas are going to be swept and, and basically get one vendor to provide that service. And, and ultimately, um, we may have to develop a no parking during street sweeping day ordinance and that will <coughs> most likely come to the council for for approval so we're i think we're probably a couple of a year maybe more into uh starting to roll up our sleeves and developing a street parking ordinance we need to solve the lafco issue first all right thanks for helping us see the plan uh councilman leesmeyer and i just want to elaborate on what i mean by um getting a, a handle on what they're doing now yeah. um just last week, I sent a picture to our city manager of a pretty small piece of trash on this in the gutter, and you could literally see where the street sweeper went out and around it. And to me, that's just a huge slap in the face as a resident taxpayer, obviously. Um, but but moreover, you see a lot of times when the trucks aren't cleaned out and they're just dragging dirt everywhere and making a big money mess. So I'm a big proponent if we have a program and there's something that's that's already out there, I'd like to just see it dialed in. That's it. Understood. All right, Imelda. Okay. Um, let's see. <coughs> okay, m oh, moving on. So aesthetics of the city also under public safety, that was actually completed within this last year. The last um, action item that was pending was the development of the design guidelines for, for commercial buildings, and that was uh, completed. Um, and then the police department formation, that's pretty much completed. The only um, outstanding item is the to analyze adequacy of the public safety diff, but that's part of a uh, comprehensive fee study that the RFP was already issued, and that should be completed um, in July 2021. Um, additionally, we added uh, from the last workshop the new fire station five, formerly Quell Valley, and the key action items coming up are the design and environmental part, which is October 2021 for an estimated completion. And the construction start date is estimated to be in December 2021 as well. Um, as mentioned earlier, staff did complete the response time assessment and funding strategy has been completed. And the last objective under public safety is the fire services citywide needs assessment. Um, staff added the fire department strategic plan key action item from the um, March 2020 council workshop, and that is estimated to be completed at the end of this year as well. And with that, I um, will stop here for the public, any public safety discussion or further recommendations. If you look at the um, spreadsheet, the worksheet I handed out, the first, um, page one, two, and three, have all the different objectives. The highlighted items are what's pending. Um, page four is a blank sheet, so we can keep track of what's been added or any revisions that you'd like to do at this time. Okay, council, before she proceeds uh, under public safety, do we have any questions, comments, uh, suggestions for future goals, objectives, or projects? I don't hear any, I'm sorry, Councilman Carwin. Yeah, I was, um, I, I know with the advent of our police department that we moved code enforcement to law enforcement as, as under their umbrella. I was curious if there's any report on how that's working out as a, as a changeover, a comparison before and after code enforcement became under law enforcement. If there's a cost saving or a time saving, any kind of update on that. Uh, great, thank you, Councilman Carwin. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's actually working very well, in particular about parking. So we have uh, community service officers that are doing all public parking, so we daily get complaints about 
motorhomes and cars parked in front of fire hydrant, that kind of stuff. And then on private property, the code enforcement is working on that. So those the, those CSOs and code enforcement work hand in hand. So uh, I think we're getting a, a little better handle on the parking issues. Um, and then there are some ordinance ordinances that we are writing and rewriting. If you want to know what those are, just so that if you want to add some, this would be a good time. Um, did I answer your question on parking? Well, it wasn't specifically a parking. I was more I, w I was more concerned when we when the decision was initially made to move code enforcement under under the uh, police department. I was concerned that a it was going to overburden the police uh, the police department with staffing and requests and things like that. And I was curious how the responsiveness has been to code enforcement issues, kind of before and after the changeover and if there's any comparison like was it the right call does it need to be moved back or is it ex is it excelling in under our expectations so that would be something that i wanted to add under here was to have an evaluation of the code department as a future um you know goals and objectives to look at to look at that I, I don't know if that's i don't know if this is the time we ask the question how's it going i, I think we give them direction this is what we want to see maybe as a council. We want to see how it's doing. Is that, do I have that right? So that's, that would be my, that was one of the things I had written down to maybe bring that back sometime. And yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. I think that's yeah. something I'd like to see because, you know, I wasn't here when that decision was made. And so I, I have no frame of reference as to how it was going and why the change was made and whether it's been a successful move. So I'd, 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 I'm all with you. I'd love to see a report on that to make sure that we're going in the right direction before we expand by adding additional services with the street sweeping enforcement and all of that stuff. Yeah, Councilman Carwin, I would, I would add that uh, when we came back for the mid-year ask, we, uh, we were actually gonna probably eliminate the management position that, that hasn't been filled and add a supervisor and then add another tech so there's more people on the street uh, the sergeant that is running code enforcement now is it's probably 65% of his job is code enforcement So I I'm not the right person to say if it's working or not I definitely think we should go down the road and then take a look back to see if it's working where it's at I personally I think they're doing they like being with us because it's similar in nature as far as enforcement um, yeah, I think a, I think it definitely deep dive is a good idea. Chief Walsh, when do you think uh, a good recommendation would be for us to anticipate you being comfortable to give a decent report that's going to cover a certain period of time? I think by the summertime, because they started in May, but we were right at the last two months before we went live, and so they actually kind of got neglected that first couple months. <laughs> And so now we're starting to, to hit on all eight cylinders, but you know it's taken us a while because we, we had some of us had to learn how to deal with code enforcement. It wasn't in our wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, but you know uh, the code enforcement officers have actually sat down with us and said, "Here's some of the things that we think would work better." So we're going to do weed abatement differently based on their recommendations. So I, I, but I think in June it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to look at it. There was a lot of concern that. If they came to law enforcement, you know, with the PD, that they'd be overbearing and, and a little more, they would act differently. I don't see that. We're trying to get compliance more than we're trying to, to write tickets. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Armando. Well, I was going to mention a, a lot of the things that you've mentioned, but one of the things that, that we're trying to gauge is, to, to answer your question, is whether that was the right move. We felt that it could be the right move. Um, and uh, but right out the gate, we had some operational problems. We lost our manager, uh, and and uh, we were trying some new things to see if one of the sergeants could actually handle it. And and we, you know, six months into it, we we said it's probably something that we should go back to a manager. So we're now uh, going to be uh, looking at hiring a supervisor uh, to supervise the workload. But code enforcement is one of those subjects, one of those departments that really cover a lot of things, a lot of things. What we are seeing here right now is that, that they are working, they're, they're collaborating more with the PD. Uh, they, they were handed radios. They do encounter a lot of issues from aesthetics 
all the way to homelessness and encampments and drug activity and things like that. So the, the, the coordination is, is in, in my mind, is a lot better than it was before uh, because they're connected to our PD and connected to the park rangers now. So there's a sort of a, there's more eyes on the street when it comes to that. But what we are trying to do now is we're trying to sort of uh, see if we can find a good supervisor that can manage the, not only the, the, st the staffing, uh, the workforce, but also the caseload. And uh, one other interesting uh, dynamic that's happening in Menifee is that the caseload is increasing because we're becoming a larger city, a lot more dynamic city, a lot more things happening that are requiring code enforcement to, to be there. So we are happy to bring back maybe an assessment. Uh, Chief, you think probably sometime in July, August, we can bring back something that could help us gauge to see where we are and where we need to go and, and if we need... Um, more uh, elements to add to the court enforcement. Department. Yeah, mine, mine too, man. And so do we need, I, I don't want to burden today with a discussion on this if it's the not appropriate place. Do, do we need to make a motion to add it to something or is it just guidance by suggestion? What's the formal process that we need to go through here? So so, so my hope is to take all your comments and I, I'm already figuring out that that's going to be a couple of activities that we add to the plan to come back to you. And I do, I do see the overall concern that you have, and I think we need probably need to do a better job explaining how the the, the process works. Yeah, I, I can summarize my, my concerns are twofold. One, I want to make sure that we made the right move cost wise by adding it to as a law enforcement as opposed to kind of a standalone or a city department, and I also want to make sure that it's not diverting. Uh, personnel or budgetary resources from law enforcement itself, crime, you know, prevention. Um, by doing that, by having them manage code enforcement, I, I just want to make sure that we're not like the chief or whoever isn't to be, isn't diverting attention from. I, I, I it sounds insulting, but I, you know what I mean. Yep. The uh, that it's not an extra managerial thing or an administrative thing that could be done separately, rather than having law enforcement be in charge of it. Or if it's working seamlessly and they're working together, great, and it's adding and benefiting law enforcement. That would be important to know too. Okay. So if that is the consensus of the council, we can take those comments and build some action items and come back. You know, we hope to come back with this thing, with this uh, plan sometime before the before the budget adopted, so you can adopt this new plan uh, and and put it into action. Thank you. Would that that would include the supervisor position you're talking about? That that's already it, it was approved in the mid year mid year yep. uh, ask uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think they're already recruiting for that. Right, Chief? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to, uh, under public safety, I just want to thank Chief Walsh. I know this has been the startup year, and we're a little over six months, I'm getting close to a year. Um, and so I, I would like to be able to hear or add to our goals and objectives and implementation um, just how the first year kind of went and what you see is a need um, and a focus that uh, as you have had your 12 months, so this is, would be after the 12 months. So reporting out to us as a council to make sure we are on the right direction as well in the decisions that we make and direction we give in regards to our police department. And I, if possible, and I don't know if this goes on here, but on possible, since we weren't able to do a real city grand opening, to do a one-year anniversary, if possible, something. So, so that would, so, yeah. So for today, I think uh, Armando and I have been talking about, we need to, we do need to do more council updates because there's a lot of great stuff happening. But for my ask to the council would be, uh, there are programs that 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 are w waiting in the wings. There's some technology we want. We're starting to roll out. So uh, I don't, I don't. So in this plan, it talks about creating a police department, but in this this plan doesn't go further. It doesn't go to the next step. So I, I guess you know there's pieces like technology and, and programs that we can implement that. I would need to know if that's something you want in the plan or or. I'll just go forward and do it, but sometimes it's good to 
for you to, to give that direction. So I appreciate that because I had evaluation. I wasn't the right word to put. So as my evaluation, that's what I was kind of envisioning is, okay, we've done this. We've started it. Now where do we need to go? Where do we need to focus? So um, you said that very well. Um, another thing that I had under this area was... Um, just an update on the process of our city homeless program. I talked to you personally. You've said there's been some changes. I know from the past, the kind of the program and the vision that we had as a council was responsible compassion. And now there's been some changes, I guess, with SWAG. So I think that would be good for us to know how are we handling and what is the focus and the plan for homelessness under under that um, under that program, and then on on uh, rewriting or writing um, updates to uh, any kind of development codes. Um, I don't know if we need to relook at the illegal dumping. I know we've done it once, and I don't know if we need to relook at it again. You know, we went back in preparation for today and realized that, you know, Colin and I sat right over there and presented, but guess what? We didn't come back for a second reading. So the fee structure is not in place. So we need to go back and get that in front of the council. Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> some of the technology that we're talking about and, and as COVID starts to subside, we're signing up volunteers. I, I want to have a whole volunteer program for illegal dumping. I really, think there, there's some things we could do. And um, I think we should keep that in the forefront on this plan. Okay. Because if we don't, we'll forget about it or, or, or we won't measure it. So I think it's important illegal dumping is in this plan. Okay. Thank you. And then for our fire, um, just, you know, I know that we, uh, the ladder truck was important to replace and I'm waiting to see it and just waiting to hear any updates, which I already see is in the plan from fire and the needs. So that's what I have. So uh, the best thing I can do for giving you an update is uh, one of the issues that transpired with the ladder truck was uh, a build out design issue with uh, the county does the specifications then the the city adopted um, the purchase of that ladder truck and when it was being built there was some problems with the specifications of the builder's outcome that went to a litigation level with the county which then caused a complete gag order for any discussion of the ladder truck it that ladder truck along with uh, Several other cities that were also on board in that all are in the pending phases that we hope soon we'll have an answer um, to the ladder trucks delivery. I believe all of them are in Southern California, but county council and the um, builder are still finalizing those details of that legal issue over the specifications and the build out of them. And that's pretty much between COVID delaying it originally and then that particular piece also transpiring has caused a significant delay in the delivery of, of all those ladder trucks. I believe uh, the first one to be delivered um, in the line is the city of Temecula's. And so the, that'll give us a really good indication of how soon um, we'll be seeing the one here in Menifee once that one is is finally approved and accepted because that'll be the, the, the basic phases and finalization of the acceptance of all the build outs on them. Um, so that's a, really the only piece I have for, for the ladder truck information that I can share outright. Other than that, I don't even know um, in county council's hands where they're totally at with that agreement. Okay. All right, Thank thanks you. chief. Do you have more uh, public safety items? I'm done. Right. We're Thank still you. on public safety items, and I've got a few uh, on here, but I'm going to start with the city manager. Did you want to? Just, just a quick follow-up on that, on, that on that plan that we're developing for the uh, fire citywide needs assessment. One of the items that we also identified last year 
was the need to add a second paramedic truck to the city. And um, last year we talked about doing it in, two, in, in a two-step approach. And right now we're, we're actually funding the purchase of the equipment, the, the vehicle. And then uh, Chief Barnett is going to be looking at the staffing needs. Uh, so possibly for next fiscal year, they're going to be including a, a staffing plan to be able to have um, you know, one paramedic unit station at Station 7, and then possibly the other one. Uh, Chief, have we made a decision on 68? Yeah, so the 68 is the proposed location, and obviously data and statistics will help support that. But as the city manager was talking about, is, is it's a two-step process, one for a better service level until uh, an additional facility is built in the southeast part of the city because that's obviously where we have a lot of development, but we don't have a lot of uh, service ability. It's all extended ETAs to that ability. And then as we staff a squad, then the next step, once we get a facility um, designated and built, then when we had do the additional staffing of an engine company there, it will not be such a, a large cost. So that's where the two-step process is. We'll start with part of the staffing in the squad and move that squad staffing um, to the new location once that is built out. So we're only adding an addition to those bodies instead of each time it being such a significant increase. And then we can do some of the stop gaps for the service while we're attempting to get all those things set in place from the facility and, and whatnot. I believe uh, the high school's getting pretty close to being finished in that area and, and obviously that's just the first step in several developments that are all occurring in that area. All right, thanks for the update on that. Um, Councilman Leesmeyer has been patient. Um, thank you for that. I was gonna ask about the squad truck. That was that was one of the questions. I knew we were doing the 68 renovation. I figured that's where it was gonna end up. Uh, and a couple questions for Pat. Um, um, you're the expert, so I'll lean on you. Just this is just a general question. Um, would a commercial enforcement officer be something valuable for the department? And I'll preface that by saying, um, as the city continues to grow with with industrial, and we're starting to see a lot more trucks and things like that, we've already had some issues with a lot of you know heavy trucks on different roads that they shouldn't be on. Uh, that's why I'm asking if that would be a valuable tool in your toolbox. And then my second question. Um, was with, was with regard to the substation. Is that is that a fitting place for the substation? Is that enough? Do we need more in the northern end of the city? Any thoughts on that? Well, for, first off, commercial uh, enforcement would be really important. Uh, it's um, the traffic study is close, and and then I think we would need a truck route. I don't know if truck route's going to be covered in that or not, Yolanda. But uh, truck routes would be good because these. You know we're the fourth fastest growing city in California, and uh, these big trucks are, are here working and uh, tearing up our roads. And so it'd be nice to have truck routes. Uh, so we've done some in code enforcement on dump trucks dumping dirt where they shouldn't. And I got to be honest with you, some of these drivers they don't have a commercial driver's license, and so that's pretty important that they they know how to drive these trucks mm -hmm. in our city. So yes, I think that'd be very beneficial. Uh, and my traffic people are chomping at the bit to do that. It's just incrementally, you know, it might be year two or maybe, maybe next summer we'll start once we have the truck routes. The, the um, um, substation. The substation. You know, uh, it's we we're using it periodically. We're not we haven't staffed it yet. We would really like to staff it with volunteers. We have fifty volunteers right now in, in background, and and uh, some of them are experienced from the former crime watch so i think if we could staff it then they can you know, have a radio they can call us there i think it's good i i really do think something in the next couple of years in the quail valley area would be nice i don't know what's going to happen to the firehouse but uh it's you know the city manager is going to throw something at me right about now <laughs> But I think that would be good. Something uh, in the Quail Valley areas, it would be nice to be able to, to pull in there and write your reports and be close. So, But that again, that would be down the road as well, I think. Is the substation now 
up there big enough? Is that is there enough space? Yeah, it's it's enough space. Uh, we're, we're most likely uh, by this summer we're probably going to move our our problem oriented policing team out there, uh, just because we're running out of desk space down the street. Uh, so and we don't need a whole lot for them. Three desks would be fine, and 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 they'll work wherever. So that would be good. This morning, we actually talked with staff to revisit uh, creating an unapproved track route for the city. So we started talking about that before. We just have so many projects that we're working on. But uh, we did talk about that, so that's probably something that we would uh, spend some time now on to develop an approved track route for the city. Okay, cool. Uh, Chief Walsh, you had mentioned, you know, whatever we're going to be calling the former crime watch. And was there any uh, other infrastructure things like vehicles that would need to be purchased, or do, have we already taken care of that? So we, we have the one vehicle from crime watch, and uh, I think we've secured another one. So we'll have two, and one of them is wrapped. It says Menifee Police Volunteers. So we're going to, we've changed the name. We, uh, and they're, as soon as they're vaccinated and we open and, and we can get them in the car, they want to do it. So, yeah. And we're going to have uh, a, a whole plan for them, you know, not just the parks, but, you know, problem areas, graffiti areas, d illegal dumping areas. So we have a, we're building that plan, waiting for that moment we can get them in the door and working. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Dynas, did do you have? Yeah, I, my question was answered. Okay, thanks. very good. Any other on uh, public safety? All right, Imelda, let's move on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then just a quick reminder, as Armando mentioned, we will be bringing back all these revisions back to council for adoption. Um, and just to um, just as just to confirm, um, so we will be meeting with uh, with um, staff on the evaluation mm -hmm. of PD, the one year anniversary of PD opening updates on the process of city homelessness program, um, the dates on, um, uh, we'll talk to um, staff about the uh, possibly a volunteer program for illegal dumping, um, look at the development codes, um, fire ladder truck updates, and uh, did I miss anything else? Commercial enforcement. Good. Oh, commercial enforcement, okay. Yeah, trucks. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to um, land use. And um, actually, I will be deferring to um, to our Director of Community Development, Cheryl Kitsero, to give an update on um, objectives 2.1 and 2.2, the sphere of influence analysis to determine future ultimate city limits and the annexation. Thank you, Amelda. So as you recall, for this item, we did a workshop with the council in December of 2019, and the council at that time directed staff to do additional public outreach before expending uh, city funds for any of the studies that would be required to move forward with a sphere of influence uh, amendment to the general plan to uh, allow for future annexation. We did community outreach with uh, Supervisor Washington's office staff, county staff, the Winchester Municipal Advisory Committee, and then we also met with uh, Ms. Angela Little representing the Winchester Homeland Town Association. Um, all outreach efforts did indicate um, opposition to the city's efforts to create a sphere of influence and in future annexation. Um, before any future work can happen, and the first step is to conduct a municipal services review. Um, we, that does cost money given the council's direction. The city didn't uh, start that process. However, uh, LAFCO is undergoing uh, an MSR review for all 28 cities within their jurisdiction. So that did kick off, that effort kicked off this year. Um, we anticipate that being completed early next year, by the end of this year, early next year. So once that study is complete, um, that will help inform the next steps for um, any sphere of influence amendment. We also wanna talk about 
opportunities on how we move forward with, you know, boundaries of a sphere, um, how we potentially um, align that effort with other uh, detachments and such that we may want to focus on. So for, for that, um, we're currently working with LAFCO and their consultant on that municipal services review. And that will be, once that's completed, that will inform um, the next steps. Any questions? So I wasn't here when this happened. So there's a term that, that's, that, that I would just have a little question about. Is it mm -hmm. ultimate city limits? Are we talking about annexing additional property to make the city larger? Is that what is that what that means? Correct. It was so. So what what areas are we looking to acquire, and how would that happen? I think the direction from the council was to study the opportunity of expanding the city sphere out to as far as seventy nine to the east, and possibly um, north of Mapes. And I cannot. I'm uh, I'm blanking on the road that would be north of Mapes. Um, that is still within the county before you get to the city of Paris. So I can't, I can't attest to the geographical boundaries that she's mentioning. Um, the idea was brought out because there were some property owners out to the east of the city that expressed um, an overwhelming desire to be a part of the city and not be a part of the county. Because simply because of the planning process. The planning so what neighborhoods process. are we talking about there? Are there, are there names out there? Is it like, I, I, I'd mess it up if I said names, but the areas that I know of specifically are pretty much out to Leon Road, up to Newport, and that, that, that section there. So Newport down to Leon, um, out to Leon, down to Scott. There's areas like that. Barton's plan. What's that? The Barton specific Barton. plan. And looking at... Um, Star milling. Yep. So, so the sphere of influence would be kind of a step one and then an actual annexation boundary would be something else sphere of influence is kind of we want a seat at the table in case there's development projects that are coming before the county and we could at least be uh, a stakeholder that can say hey we'd like them to join a cfd and participate in funding things that's kind of what the sphere of influence is about and then in the future it usually uh in leads to potential annexation of moving the city's boundaries so Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I don't want to sit here pretending I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we kind of initiated it and ran into some resistance. And But I, I like that Cheryl reminded us that LAFCO's doing their own municipal services review. And so that's probably an opportunity where we can participate with other cities as well and others who have interests and uh, communities of interest that uh, we can equally and fairly discuss it. So. I think the, that's, that's the sphere of influence also, um, you know, when there's projects that are queued up in the county and they land in the sphere of influence of the city, the city gets unique rights to take a look at that project and study its impacts on the city, even though it might not be a part of the city. We get, a, I mean, I think we get a little bit extra shot right now just because we've been vocal. But in the past, a lot of things were happening on the east side of the city that we just had no clue. Things would happen in a vacuum and nobody would tell us. We'd find out through our different... Um, you know, connections at the county or regional meetings, and we'd bring it back and say, well, wow, what's going on here? We never had any idea this was happening. And so we, we needed to start to understand more what was happening outside of our city, around the edges. Yeah. Which we heard should have happened when we became a city, and we don't know why that wasn't included. As you know, we have traffic down Newport coming from the east. As Chief Barnett mentioned, there's a high school going in right outside of our city boundaries and a lot of houses being built out there, but yet that's going to affect, is that going to affect our fire department? You know, so we need to say, we need a place at the table. That's, that's how. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. Armando. So Mayor, actually, Councilman Solberg and Lise Meyer answered the question that, that I was going to try to answer, but the, the, the effort is not simply to just annex more land and have the city become bigger. The, the effort is to be, I actually have the seat at the table. There's, there's, you know, when the city first incorporated, we were one of the only cities that does not have a sphere of influence, which means we don't, we don't have a seat at the table when the county is making land use decisions right outside of our borders. So one of the first things is, is for us to be able to convince the county in LAFCO that we need to have an area towards that area of town because that's where most of the development will take place in the future. 
And, you know, our fear is that we don't have a seat at the table and that area continues to develop because eventually all that traffic will impact the city. And not, not only the traffic, but the, the, the impacts to the rest of the municipal services like police, like fire, and things like that. So that's kind of a two-pronged approach. We, we like to be able to have a seat at the table, expand the sphere, and then eventually over time, if there are property owners that would like to be part of the city, because we do have more localized public services, that we can actually do that in the form of an annexation incrementally, not at the same time, but incrementally as we can afford it to. This is just kind of a fun one that doesn't have anything to do with anything, but there is a project outside of our city boundary in that area that's got a great big billboard right now that says Menifee living at its finest. I'm like, but you're not in Menifee. All right. <laughs> but they want to be, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> all right. I think, Jonathan, next, are you up on parks and trails? Oh, okay. Moving Keeps on. Keeps happening to me. Yes. So the next section under land use 2.3, parks and trail, enhancing the standards of the park system. Um, as noted, we already looked at the Quimby fee. Uh, we're definitely looking at our, our diff fee structure, then also all of our um, fees that we charge for community services as part of the comprehensive fee study that finance is undertaking. And I believe um, Ms. Clayton mentioned that there's already an RFP out to seek a firm to do that comprehensive fee study for all the fees that are charged um, for the city. So uh, we're piggybacking on that. Um, also, um, looking at the fl phase plan for Evans property on the agenda for this Wednesday is um, uh, bringing forward for council consideration a design uh, contract for the pump track. So we're going to keep that moving forward. We pr provided a conceptual design to the Parks, Recreation, and Trails Commission at the end of last year. And we're taking that conceptual design, bringing it to the next phase to have a full design for the uh, city council to consider. Um, also, one item under there was um, for us to study looking at forming a um, parks related nonprofit and I know the city council had a desire to form that nonprofit to try to raise additional funds so we did do, do kind of a deeper dive on that and presented that to the parks commission at the end of last year so we looked at some other cities um, in the county that uh, in surrounding that already had um, foundations we talked to Chino Hills they incorporated a foundation in 2010 talked to the city of Corona they also had a foundation that they formed in 1994 and we asked them not only how much money are they raising from doing foundation events but how much staff time and support and money is the city putting towards these things and so what we found and uh, we asked them for numbers pre-covid because right now it's just it's not fair to look at it right now with all the restrictions on events so we asked them hey how'd you guys do in like nine, uh, fiscal year 1920 before all the covid restrictions so even though they've been established for a while, we found that City of Chino Hills said they're, they're, they have a full-time dedicated staff person that they're paying for um, about you know somewhere around eighty thousand dollars with benefits, and they're actually losing a little bit of money because they're only raising um, somewhere around hundred thousand dollars a year. So that sounds like a large number, but when you put that staff cost in there and the supplies, it they're actually netting like a negative five thousand dollars. Same thing with City of Corona; their foundation's been around for gosh uh, twenty-five years. Uh, a little longer, and um, the, right now they, they said they raised 5,000 bucks and they um, their um, net proceeds was actually negative $13,000. And then um, some, some of our commissioners are also on the county commission, so we asked, well, how's the county commission doing? They said very similarly, where they're actually spending a lot of time and effort and marketing and all that stuff trying to build up this foundation, but they're, they're actually not uh, raising a lot of money. And I know that um, when the uh, council directed us to look at this the idea was hey can we use this as a mechanism to raise funds to you know build parks and um, bolster our uh, community programming so when we looked at what the other cities were doing the uh, recommendation and brought this forward to the commission the recommendation is like maybe we should hold on this right now and still explore these other avenues that the city's looking at like you know reassessing our our fees, uh, definitely continuing once we're able to do events and other programs, bolstering our sponsorship program. We had some very successful sponsorships in the past for like Independence Day, um, where we had you know, 10, 15, $20,000 in sponsorship. So still explore those avenues um, and maybe put this one on hold right now, kind of see where the economy is going, see if it's getting better, see as um, you know, maybe can roll in as part of our sponsorship program in the future. But kind of looking at that snapshot of what the other cities were doing pre-COVID, it, 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 it didn't really make sense for us to move forward at this time. Okay. okay. And then um, value-wide parks transition, 
Um, council has been provided a few updates uh, over the last month on that, and we're still working with the city's attorney's office on um, uh, keeping that moving forward in the future. Jonathan, I, <clears throat> I had a question. Um, one of those items that we had added last year was the open space nature oh, yes. preserve, and we've checked it off as completed, but I know it's part of the ongoing yes. category, so I, I, I kind of hate to put a check there because then it means, okay, we're done. But I don't want us to be done on that. In fact, I don't think we've done anything really at all other than talk about it. So um, I, I'm really interested in create, finding a location, seeing if we can purchase it, put together a plan to create a nature center and an interpretive center and those those kinds of things. So but please, let's not check the box and make it go away because we still have tasks to complete well and uh, and maybe we can update that because we, i don't see it as yeah we're done because as you're stating we haven't actually built anything yet but it is an ongoing task when we have new developments coming forward for for example like sumac ridge where they have a, a conservation area on the north part of their plan uh, we could have just said oh well that's just a conservation area but we actually worked with them and said no you know what let's since that is a, a nature area that we can preserve let's put a trail in there where we can have some signage and educate some people and have that so we're looking at opportunities like that that where we can get creative and um, and have um, some of it um, done with the, uh, these new developments so definitely we're, we're, we're still some ongoing we'll continue to provide updates like that to the council Thank you. And maybe, Imelda, if there's, instead of a check, maybe put an O in there or something like that that means ongoing. And yes, that will do. It doesn't end up dropping off. You know, Council on, members, on anything that, on... Uh, you know, on that, I've often thought of the KBM Park area that we have that's county, but it's... Paris. Oh, is it Paris? Yes, it's in the boundary of the city of Paris. Oh, yes. it is. Okay. So that makes my thought. So thank you. <laughs> But under parks, um, I, I appreciate um, I, I appreciate the create creativity that your parks department and has, is doing. Um, I've been thinking with over 100,000 people here in the city of Menifee, and we have uh, children and youth and adults of all ages, that this is one area that was at the top of my list that we need to really... Um, strategically plan and and move forward a few projects and I so I appreciate the pump track how that's coming forward but out that Evans Park area you know we already have the property um, and we need to think out of the box some of the recreational activities that we can provide here such as an outdoor hockey rink um, that's something we don't have here but I um, I talked to uh, one of our parks guys and he and uh, he was we had visited kind of the same area and we were sharing really fantastic park ideas that this area had it just wasn't the basic swing you know slide but it was very very creative family oriented and since we are a family oriented community i just would really like us to look at thinking out of the box and creating some park amenities that are different and that would have would be benefit our families our youth and our adults so that that would be something that i have that's just really big on on my heart is to provide those areas for our our families that live here can i ask what some of those ideas were i'm curious about the 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 type of amenities you're interested in so because um, the pump track is a new thing for me, and I thought that was kind of cool and unique, and I heard about that. So, so one outdoor hockey rink for youth to be able to go and use, and there was a, a train at a park that that I visited. There's slides built into like a rock wall. Uh, there's just so many things out there um, that are that are just unique amenities. And so I'd, I'd like us to look at some of those unique amenities and see what we can, what, what we can do for our parks, extra and over and above and beyond, especially Evans, since we have the property. And I know that's we're looking at phases, but it's a need, and we've got the people here, and we need to be able to have some of those family-friendly activities, parks, amenities. Have you ever done like a, a recreational needs 
assessment? You know, what 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 is what are we lacking here? Have we, have we done something formal on that with a report? Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a Parks, Recreation, and Trails Master Plan that was uh, presented and adopted by City Council in 2016. So just about five years ago, the council did ask me last year when it would be a good time to uh, reevaluate that. And so at, at that time, I said, you know, it'd probably make most sense once we're, we've completed the annexation process of Valleywide, we have control of all of our parks. Uh, but as that process is elongating a little bit, we, we might have to uh, revisit that sooner than that annexation process. And maybe the annexation process is part of it. Well, I think it'd be worthwhile to have and then at least have that knowledge so as we move forward, we'll, we'll, you know, better to have foresight and then move forward than get there and then look back and say we should have done this, we should have thought of that instead. It's a beautiful park plan if you haven't had a chance to look at it. I have. I, you know, 2016, we've grown significantly since then. Yes. All right. Okay. So, Amelda. Yes. Please proceed ahead. Yes, and if you're following along, all the land use items are page five through eight of the um, of the spreadsheet yeah. that were um, handed out. Um, so moving on to the Cherry Hills uh, Plaza commercial development, um, and I will um, defer to our economic development director, Gina Gonzalez. Good afternoon. I just wanted to touch base on our Cherry Hills Plaza commercial development. And for those that may have not had the history, wanted to provide some of the background here today. Um, back in 2016, um, it was asked of city staff to analyze the commercial center on what could be um, envisioned as revitalizing that center, that core area. Um, so staff proceeded. We engaged property owners, had some um, uh, community meetings with the property owners themselves and some tenants. From that, we engaged with um, KMA and created a revitalization plan of what it could um, turn into and how we could take the sum of 20 different property owners and really um, invigorate the center. From that, we created conceptual renderings to envision and get excited about it and to really uh, uh, help some of the property owners and tenants buy into this idea of what could be there. And from there, uh, we developed a phase two of the revitalization plan, which was really a feasibility study to really um, study the market conditions on what it would take to see something like that transpire and happen. And what came about was um, really it came down to the lack of multifamily housing in the area and also the unimproved um, land in the area that was affecting the market conditions to encourage someone to buy and to invest into that center. Additionally, what came out of that plan was um, an actual uh, mapping um, on how the properties could um, change some uses and also, in addition, um, a legal way for the city to uh, assist with some of the hardscape and landscaping, being that it's private property, uh, not being able to utilize um, city, city funding to um, really see that process or that project push forward. So um, we also engaged with a surveyor to assess uh, what properties to see that um, city-owned roadway would uh, move forward. And so we were able to really get a better sense of how much of that property certain individual property owners would have to either uh, grant deed over to the city to see something like that happen. Um, and we didn't engage with those property owners and they were um, really on board. So then we moved forward in surveying the additional um, property owners on creating a business improvement district and with the likelihood of that of happening. Uh, the survey did come back um, not supportive of moving forward with an assessment to create a business improvement district. So the it left staff looking to uh, really rely on an investor that would uh, take really um, the horn, so to speak, to really invest in that center and work with the city on, in a different way. Um, so staff did go to multiple ICSC meetings and looking for additional investors for that center. And then just most recently, uh, we did engage with an investor over the past year and a half who did close escrow on a good chunk of the Cherry Hills Plaza to really start and cultivate 
uh, the overall uh, revitalization of that center. So it's just the very beginning, but it's progress to see something move forward and happen there. And they're currently, um, as of last week, they're engaging with an architectural firm of what could be and could happen there at that center to engage with the city as well. Fantastic. So I apologize on the long explanation. Fantastic. <laughs> so, um, so that one is ongoing in our eyes. Um, there are two items that are on hold as far as assessing the, private, the public roadways that I was discussing um, and also the right-of-way improvement plan. Um, as far as, would you like me to move forward, Imelda? 2.6? So as far as 2.6 is the economic development plan and there's some items um, for Cheryl and I. Um, we did do an EDC update, and Cheryl worked on the Comprehensive Development Code update as well that was completed in December, which was a very, very large milestone for the city that's occurred over time um, that we've been asking for. And so to have Cheryl on staff to complete something that big was a very big deal, and I'm going to keep talking about it over and over. Sorry, Cheryl. <laughs> Um, additionally, we created our very first economic development strategic plan, or our SEDS, and again, I'd just like to tout that it was uh, the first uh, for any city in Southwest Riverside County to complete that plan, and it did come back with a letter of excellence from the EDA. And then of that, there's some task items that were pulled out of that, of one is the foreign direct investment strategy and um, it's not on hold any longer uh, staff is moving forward with a consultant to move forward with that strategy as we speak additionally uh, we've updated our demographic study and we do that annually um, as such uh, now that we're 105,000 in population and we're growing steadily uh, and we are planned um, according to the projections of hitting 116,000 in the next two years based off the growth that we're seeing from um, the residential. Additionally, we completed the hotel market feasibility study, the health needs marketing study, and we've also completed a retail and office space study and industrial study. In addition, um, which is not on here, but we took it upon ourselves and also engaged in five studies when it came to the indus industry that we have pulled from our SEDS to concentrate on, and we've engaged with Cal State San Marcos to complete those five additional studies to use as is our marketing um, with trying to do uh, our attraction efforts for those industry-specific uses. So things like advanced manufacturing, technology, um, healthcare, um, uh, entertainment and nighttime serving uses, um, and brewery and distillery uh, attraction efforts. In addition, we did the business cluster analysis, and then also we've been working on the foreign trade zone to include in Menifee, and that's been an ongoing process. Uh, what staff has worked on <laughs> when it came to the trade zone just above us that we're um, where Paris and Riverside are a part of, it's just so far apart from the, the actual port of Long Beach that were just outside the radius to be included. Um, so we've partnered and had ongoing conversations with the county because there's discussions with the county on taking over that, um, that actual foreign trade zone um, administration from March JPA. So uh, as far as if that should go through, there's an opportunity for us to work with the county on trying to expand that and um, realign that trade to where we could be included in it. We've also went as far as working with um, San Diego and trying to be included in the one that Marietta and Temecula are part of. Um, and that one, um, there's less wiggle room to move because of our proximity and distance that we're just outside of that. Um, and it wouldn't work from time or miles. So we're literally in the middle of a hole. <laughs> so um, our best bet is to keep working with the county on, um, on their efforts on trying to be included in there. But there's also an ability where we can also co-market, where it's, if it's an, a firm that's came, if they, if it's a firm that has come from overseas and they're looking for the trade zone benefits for those tax incentives, they could individually um, sign up for just their actual hotspot or their location itself, and we could try to work with them if it's in our best interest as far as incentivizing them to apply for that. And we can we already will guide them through that process, but it does benefit us overall from a marketing effort to be included in the larger trade zone 
itself. So we'll continue forward. Creating a robust workforce development plan, staff is still working towards that. Um, developing a tourism backbone in this next um, fiscal, there's been a request from staff for completing a tourism master plan now that we have a hotel and um, we have a great um, amenities that are coming online. Also, we have the college that's building the stadium. Uh, there's opportunities for us to start that process now and develop an actual master plan uh, of moving forward and attracting folks here to come visit and spend money, which in turn turns into services. Of that, we'll also be developing a tourism website. We get a lot of questions of what's there to do, where can I eat, what can I, you know, right, Ron? <laughs> Um, so our, our goal is to really help our visitors uh, uh, put in th putting that information right at their fingertips. With that, we're also working with the um, Film Commission on cataloging locations within the city to encourage film production here in our city, which in turn turns to tax um, uh, revenue for us when they're visiting and they're um, playing in our city, they're eating and they're staying. Um, this is an opportunity to encourage more of that activity here and put our name on the map. Uh, we did complete our overall economic development website, entrepreneur ecosystem, um, the streamlined development process um, initiative that I'd like to say is very, very been very, very successful uh, thanks to the development team. Um, creating a gardening program for our business retention expansion efforts. Um, and as we've all seen, we had to kick that into high gear during COVID. Um, then also our Menifee Masters Ambassadors Program, which is also very successful, and that was kicked off. And then we are currently working on an incentive program to fast track development, and we've actually been assessing um, before rolling that out what impl implications we would have to adjust that by coming out of COVID on really to spur certain development. One will be office development, especially with what we're hearing and seeing. They're saying that office development overall on Southwest Riverside County, they're saying that we have too much of it, but talking to the cities, we know that we don't have enough of it. So um, things like that is what we're overall assessing coming out of COVID. Developing an incubator, and as you know, um, incubators are extremely important And when we're talking about cultivating certain types of industries in the city and having the space to encourage that type of development and collaborative work. And so staff is um, diligently working. You know, we have the SEDS. Um, we have the opportunity to go after funding for um, an incubator up to 50% of funding being covered by our, the federal EDA um, to create something um, down the road uh, for incubation. And um, we're creatively looking for opportunities to engage and develop something like that locally. In addition, I mean, we have private industry that has come in. Um, we have Freedom Business Park, which is uh, an incubator type of industrial project just off of Hahn and Scott that has some showroom and sm smaller industrial incub incubator space. Um, but we also need office incubator space. So with that, I apologize it's so long. <clears throat> Any questions? Thank you, Gina. All right, so council members, Let's talk a little bit here regarding land use and economic development. I don't know if uh, you guys have anything. I, I, I certainly have an idea, but it's open to the council. Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, what is the current relationship between the city and the Chamber of Commerce? I know that there's been a lot of changes there. A lot of the things you're talking about with people are asking where to go, where to eat, all that kind of thing. It seems a shame that we're expending city resources on that when the businesses should be doing that kind of themselves. There's a lot of stuff that can be done that way. Are they doing that? Are they stepping up? What's the status? If I could be so blunt, the, the relationship has always been good with the chamber. It's just continually perpetuating uh, with the changes that they've had at the top. So we've never been able to create... Um, uh, an ongoing um, repetitive of nature with the chamber to where they're sustaining themselves. Um, it seems though that um, we're having to step in and create a lot of the programs that the chambers had to, or that are envisioned to support themselves. Um, so I know that they just went under again, um, 
some changes at the top and they're now getting back on their feet again and looking for the city to help guide them again. Um, it would be great for them to be self-sustaining um, to support themselves. And to your point, um, th our department does end up um, taking the brunt of a lot of those discussions when it comes to tourism. I think that it's a partnership on developing some type of tourism backbone. Um, the goal would be eventually to create some type of visitors bureau that could be self-sustaining and maybe there's a partnership in some type of funding mechanism with the city that would help um, continue it long term. Uh, but this is where, where we are and where they are, are two different places. And if we do not do something today, it's not going to happen for years to come, and we're going to miss out opportunities to get that going. My main concern is that the city becomes a marketing agency for private businesses where we're actively going out and creating programs and expending city resources and money to promote specific private businesses where that should be coming from their end. You know, as far as things like, hey, we have parks, we have an amphitheater, things that the city has put up and sponsored, that, that's, that's our job. As far as when you come to see a concert at our amphitheater that we've built, where do we eat, where do we stay, that should be coming from the business end as far as I'm concerned. So I just, I, I think that a lot of the work that you're doing, bridging the gap between businesses who want to come to the city of Menifee and making it available to them is great. And marketing to business coming into the city and getting them set up here and finding uh, matchups between larger businesses or smaller businesses and industries in the city, that's our job. But as far as getting people to go to particular restaurants, that's their job. And I just wanna make sure we don't take that on and make that a permanent part of our economic development department. Yeah, no. No, in turn, it's just supporting our overall restaurants to encourage people to shop here. But it's, it's very much like wine country, right, with what Temecula does. Using that as an advantage to encourage additional people to come here and spur additional development in the city. And um, wherever, um, when we're able to market our area to where it becomes extremely attractive, that in turn, it also draws additional business to our community. So we're using that as a marketing tool to encourage additional industries to our community. There isn't um, a technology firm that is going to want to come here if there's not places to eat, places to stay. It doesn't look like a fun happening place. So we're trying to encourage that. And it would be great to have a partner to do that. But unfortunately, they're just not there yet. And just I'll, the last thing I want to mention is um, getting this all wrapped in together. I think I, I didn't hear anything about incorporating the golf course into that as kind of part of the tourism plan. We do have a golf course. Now we have a hotel. I mean, that I, that part of the city I want to make sure is included in in the tourism plan if we're going to do that that's an amenity that we have that you know some cities don't have so to your point we have a magazine where we've taken our traditional marketing material for ICSC um, and actual business development and we've turned it into a magazine and one of the things is in there is actually our golf courses to your point exactly Armando, did you uh, want to join yeah, in? I just want to, uh, I know we're getting some really good feedback from staff and the council, but I want to, we have two hours and we might be able to go over it, but I want to reserve the last quarter of the workshop so that you can have uh, ample time to discuss any new things that you may want to add. I don't want to run out of time and not have an opportunity to get from you any additional things that you may want to add. So just want to remind you to pace the pace. All right. Are you recommending we hold our comments or can we, when we're talking about land use, we talk about land use suggestions and, and initiatives or you want everything at the end? Um, it, it's good that we're talking about it. We're getting good feedback, but I want to make sure that you, you have plenty of time at the end of the, of the presentations to talk about new things that you may want to add to the plan. So that way you don't feel rushed that you know, we're coming down to five o'clock and we're, we have to end. But again, you may also want to spend a little more time, maybe 530, if you feel like you need that time, because we really need to get uh, good feedback so that we can take into, to take this into consideration as we develop the plan that will come back to you for adoption. All right. I know that one of the one of the topics is infrastructure and it's coming up after, and I think we're going to have lots of things there. But, but I... I do have one thing I want to add to land use, but I know Councilman Leesmeyer is in the list, so we'll take him first. 
it, it might not be the appropriate time because you just mentioned what you did about infrastructure, but I think this ties a little bit more with economic development. Um, I'd like to hear uh, the possibilities of coming up with some, um, you know, CFDs or something like that in different regions of the city where we have infrastructure needs. Um, I know that we have a lot of needs in, in the southern end of the city, you know, Bailey Park, south of Scott Road, Ziders between the freeway, that kind of pocket down there. There's certain utilities that are there, certain ones that are not. Um, up in Dean's district, I'd like to hear from Dean, but um, you know, I know that there's a lot up there. Um, I know that there's the Brine line from Sapa, there's railroad, but we have we have portions of line A that are there, other portions that are not. Um, I'd like to hear if there's a way that we can come up with a comprehensive, maybe almost a needs assessment for different regions of the city that outline infrastructure needs and maybe we can start assigning ways to uh, maybe program some money there or, or incentive programs, things like that towards those different areas. I think that's a great suggestion, really. We need, there's, there's some things that we need to address and you're right, some of it's gonna cost us some money and some of it's gonna be programs that we can work with other agencies. So. Right. Um, on mine, it, it it's kind of an initiative. It has to do with land use. And I don't know if Cheryl's the right um, person or Gina, but maybe it's a tag team. But, but one of our initiatives is uh, economically prosperous. That's one of the goals that we wanna do. And really, I think that the goal there is jobs. Um, and I'm thinking about clean industry, professional jobs, and we've kind of, in our general plan land use, we've kind of said we'd really like to see that Southern Gateway as kind of the corporate business park feel, the place where we have, you know, architects and engineers and biotech, telecommunications, all those kinds of industries. One of the problems with our Southern Gateway EDC is that there's some things that are missing infrastructure-wise there, and I just wonder if we can, and then I'm asking advice now from Cheryl, um, if it makes sense for the council to create an initiative that sort of redefines that portion of the EDC, maybe it's everything south of Scott Road, um, and I'm thinking either a new general plan land use category that just calls that whole thing business park, or maybe it's a city-initiated specific plan, and that specific plan really gets down into what is this uh, corporate business park going to look like and what are the needs infrastructure-wise? I mean, can it handle it, traffic and sewer and all those kinds of things? So can I just hear from you, if if tonight we're talking about initiatives and one of those is jobs, and to me, I just see a great opportunity there, but it's not really getting any action and I want to see if there's a way that this city can put a little energy into the south portion of our southern gateway i think that's something that you know if the council wants to do that we can we could explore that i was trying to look because i thought um last time we added that you know northern gateway and southern gateway and i think as part of that the the last conversation was to evaluate you know the infrastructure deficiencies and opportunities to um, partner with other agencies and um, support future development. So I think that we can maybe refine that um, added item and get into more of the specifics, whether it be a specific plan or you know a reassessment of um, that land use uh, for EDC Southern Gateway. Okay. Um, I'd like that to come back to us as a consideration, and I know that we usually try to link our budget process and, and Rochelle's uh, world is all about making sure that the strategic vision and the, and the budget is linked to it. Um, so we'll need to get an idea, kind of a cost to complete a task, like a, like a, spe a city initiated specific plan for the uh, EDC Southern Gateway south of Scott Road if we were to make some changes down there. So I see I got a couple of uh, council members chiming in here, so I'm going to open it up to, to Councilman Leesmeyer first. Go to Dean. You want to go, Dean? All right, Dean. Okay, thank you. Um, in fact, we will be talking a little later. Cheryl was talking about, about partnering with uh, utility, other utilities that's in here. But I like to also see a, you know, a specific plan for the, the northern part as well so we know exactly what's needed and what's expected and what uh, our plans are for the future as well. You're talking about the EDC Northern Gateway? Yes. Okay, good. I'm glad you said that. Uh, Councilman Leesmeyer. So I'd be a little apprehensive about 
uh, doing city initiated specific plans. Um, I think there's a, a big um, line there between property owner rights and what the city's vision is. Um, if the vision is business park, then just come out right and say it and say that you want business park. Don't try and create plans that, that guide things a certain way. Just be blunt and say what you want. If you want it to be business park, then go into the general plan and exclude all the industrial uses and make it a business park. But when you start creating other plans and other layers of bureaucracy, it, it makes it more challenging for the landowners to navigate the plan. You, we have policies, we have things in place. You just need to modify those. Does that make sense? It does. I think that the, the idea of a specific plan is really to identify um, infrastructure needs, the, the roads, the sewer and water, and the capacity to be able to handle um, that. So, The idea of a specific plan is really to, to have multiple land uses in one area. If you want to have residential and business park and office and commercial and all these things in one area, you do that in a specific plan. But when you have an area that's already got a huge overlay of industrial or if it's EDC, I mean, EDC is kind of like a specific plan, right? It's, it's kind of already got that, that flavor. You're, you're, you're trying to... The needs assessment for infrastructure is one thing. Creating a specific plan, a planning document. I mean, if you look at what Medifi Town Center is, right? You've got residential, you've got a movie theater, you've got a commercial, you've got office, all these things in a, in a larger plan. I, I think, I don't know if that'd be the right, the right approach. Okay. And in the other, I, let me just throw in one more advantage. If you have a specific plan for that area that I described that's already in place, the environmental's done, that makes it much more shovel ready for a developer to come in so that they don't have to also spend that time and money to do that. It's already put in place for them. I'm trying to spur uh, business. I'm trying to, to put this in a place where we're ready to get started because I, what I don't want to see is stagnant land that nothing's moving and it's because maybe we're not doing what we can do up front and be creative to make it easier for development to happen sooner. So that's what it's all about. That's and and really, I wasn't saying let's do this. I was asking staff, is that an, an idea that's worth considering? So I was looking for advice. Uh, Councilman Car Carwin, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, hearing hearing both sides of of that discussion, I wonder. I mean, we're not talking about a thousand different property owners down there. Could we set up some sort of workshop with the property owners of that area to find out if they would find a specific plan beneficial, if 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 the mayor's idea is that this would make it more marketable and easier if these things were done, let's ask the people who are trying to sell it if that actually would help them. Because on one hand, yeah, I, I think putting the city's vision on, on private property is, is not, uh, you don't know what they want to do with it, but if, if it would be helpful... If we could say to them, hey, look, if we did this, would it make it easier for you to sell it? And they said, oh, yeah, if this was done, we could get a, a, a great deal on it. I'd like to hear from those owners. So if there's, if there's a dozen or less owners in that Southern Gateway, can we maybe set up a workshop with them or a conference or a, some sort of meeting like this with those folks to find out if that would be beneficial? That's a good question. Cheryl, can you, can you chime in here and just kind of give us the staff's perspective? Down in the southern, is it on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Down in the southern gateway, um, south of Scott, I I'm guessing we probably have um, more than 50 owners. Um, you know, we certainly could do some outreach um, or, or do a workshop about next steps. Um, but ultimately, you know, the city does have that land use authority. So if it was you know, moving forward with a specific plan to further refine and then set that foundation with a program EIR, um, if that's something that the council wanted to do, we, we could do that, but I, I definitely think um, doing outreach with a workshop could, could help inform that process. Okay. I appreciate what you're saying. One of the things sometimes you might find is that if you ask a property owner, uh, what would you like, they'll say, the person who has the most cash, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't care what they want to do with it. I just want the most money. So if they want to build apartments, that's fine with me, but it may not be this in line with the city's vision for the area. So if we're talking about, we want to create jobs and the property owner says the highest bidder is an apartment complex. And we got two different 
two different things. We're going, we're pulling away from each other. So, well, if we've already got bars to certain types of development, then it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. You know, putting a putting an apartment complex in that Southern Gateway EDC wouldn't be allowed anyway. Right. So that's something that's already informed to them. I just don't want to take action in somebody's best. You know, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> kind of thing. I'm going to make it easier for you to sell your property by doing all this other stuff and restricting all these uses. You're welcome. And I just want to make sure that that we're working in conjunction with the property owners instead of in spite of them. That's all. I get it. M Mayor, if I, if I can add, you know, the current property owners um, may not be the ones eventually developing the property. So I think there'd be um, a, a certain level of education that would come with any type of outreach to, to explain, you know, what a specific plan is, how, how it could benefit yeah. them in the long run. That's a good point. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? All right. Amelda, go ahead. Okay, and just to um, confirm under the land use items, we will be um, revising the um, open space nature present, uh, preserve effort. That will no longer be completed. That will be more of an ongoing item, um, as well as a um, revision or update of the uh, parks master plan. And uh, let's see, Mayor Pro Tem Sobek would like staff to think outside of the box to look at different amenities, uh, look at outdoor hockey rinks, et cetera, for the Evans property. Um, the uh, council member Leesmeyer noted a needs assessment for different areas of the city, including areas for infrastructure and programming, et cetera. Also a request for staff to look at, um, actually the Southern and Northern Gateway is in, under the infrastructure um, objective. We'll get there in just a few. Um, council member Dinas noted adding um, a specific plan to the Northern Gateway and a uh, uh, staff um, and council um, discussed uh, setting up a workshop with property owners and providing some education. Miss anything? If I might add, um, if we could dust off the park master plan and, and look at, you know, this has been about five years. I don't, I don't, okay. I didn't hear you say that. Maybe I, I missed it. I was tr trying to write down some things. So if we can do that and look at it and, and see, I mean, the more diverse and the more the city grows, the more varying interest in, in recreational needs and wants happen. So it'd be worthwhile taking a look at that again. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Jonathan, on that Parks Master Plan, we spent a lot of time and money on it, and it's still pretty fresh. I mean, nothing, not much has changed. So if we can do maybe an update to it instead of a start over so we're not spending a quarter of a million bucks okay. on something that's basically the same thing. <laughs> thank you. Okay, All thank right. you. Okay, so moving on to City Hall. This is on page nine of the worksheet. Um, and so the 90-day feasibility study, that was completed, and that was for the current City Hall that we're in now. Um, staff is currently working on the feasibility study and funding options to build the future City Hall. Um, we, have, uh, we are working with the architect regarding updating the feasibility study to include PD and also looking at uh, financing options. And um, I will defer to our assistant, the city manager, Jeff Wyman. If there's any other updates? Um, I think you pretty much covered it. I mean, we're trying to make sure that we right size a future city hall, uh, especially now that we've added PD and make sure that uh, we um, build one that uh, works for the future of the city. Also taking into consideration some of the new things that have come about in the last year, which is remote working. How is that going to affect us in the long run as far as a future city hall? Um, and so we're uh, hoping to finalize that study this end of this month, which will then, of course, be the basis for a cost estimate, which rolls into a future financing uh, options uh, that will be forthcoming as well. Okay, and that completes the uh, city hall um, goal area. It at this time, we can take any discussion or recommendations to add anything under this uh, category. No? Okay. Moving on to infrastructure. Um, and this can be noted on page 11 through 13 of your worksheets. Um, so we'll start with the Scott Road to 15 improvement. That was actually completed. Um, and the pavement management program that is completed and ongoing, that is um, something that is updated annually. 
And now I will um, defer. I will um, have uh, Carlos uh, Geronimo, our principal engineer, give an update on the Hol Holland overpass. The key action item up, um, coming up is the right of way acquisition, and also the McCall interchange program or the environmental and design portion. Um, some of the key action items are complete completing the final design, right of way acquisition, and develop funding strategy. Okay. Here. Yeah. Thank you, Melda. Um, so for Holland Road Overpass, um, we've uh, acquired most of the right of way that we need uh, for that project, except for one property. We uh, submitted a new offer to the property owner and we're awaiting the response. So in the next few weeks, um, we'll either receive a response or we're gonna go back to council for uh, uh, further recommendations on how to move forward. So, um, well, then that the plans are a 95% completion, um, but that's based on when we get the right of way uh, until counters will uh, will not sign off on the plans until the right of way is there. So we're just waiting on that pretty much. As far as the funding, uh, we've completed a funding strategy. Uh, we expect to be fully funded by this next fiscal year coming up. Um, and that's it for Holland Road Overpass. For McCall Interchange, uh, we received seven proposals for design and environmental uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, we went through an evaluations and interviews, and we're working with a top firm on the cost negotiations, and we should have a recommendation here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we're expecting that to be awarded on the second council meeting in April. Okay, and that's all I have for those two projects. Thank you, Carlos. And then uh, our next item, item 4.5, is identifying uh, Menifee at entrances. Um, and I will pass it over to Gina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when it came to identifying uh, placement locations for signage, um, there was originally a request for the overpasses uh, within the 215. And that was discussed and brought to council as far as um, exactly how much that would cost for each of those. And it's upwards uh, for each sign between three and four hundred thousand for each <laughs> sign um, on the freeway. Um, in addition, uh, staff uh, worked on identifying um, uh, wayfinding signage, and we completed an RFP for overall a sign package within the city from. Uh, street signs to wayfinding signs. It's a complete overall comprehensive package. Um, we did send out an RFP. Um, we did end up selecting RSM. We have been engaged with them and we've been working through it. Uh, we are on the tail end of that process right now as we speak and um, we're working on renderings and then the last component would be bringing that before uh, the city council for consideration. Um, of adopting a formal comprehensive package for the entire city. And then additionally, then the next phase would be the actual um, specifications and funding. So other than that, uh, we're on our way. Gina, why were those signs so expensive, the freeway ones, three to 400,000? So, yeah, so from the engineering to the actual construction of of something along the interchange in addition to having to get Caltrans approval and going through that process um, from start to finish is between three and 400 for each sign. And a good, um, uh, I guess, buffer to understand that cost is this is exactly what Lake Elsinore went through. Mm, okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, it's very expensive. I'd rather see all of our roads resurfaced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Um, and moving on to the Garbani interchange, um, I'll pass it over to back to Carlos. Okay, Garbani interchange. Um, we are waiting for Caltrans to give us the final cooperative agreement. Uh, it's been on headquarters for about two months. Uh, it's been taking them a little bit longer than usually it takes them. So as soon as that is uh, approved, we can go ahead and submit a, uh, we'll take it to council for adoption, of course. It's an agreement with Caltrans for the, uh, um, but the initial phase of the project, uh, project information development phase. Um, it's about a year and a half process. It's more of a planning document uh, that tells Caltrans what it is that we intend to do there, what the limitations are for right away and other constraints in that area. 
and it's kind of a guiding tool for the next phases, which are uh, environmental and design after that. So if everything is uh, in accordance with Caltrans and we get that um, uh, cooperative agreement uh, signed off in the next month, we should issue an RFP uh, around April or May of this year. Uh, we are fully funded for that phase of that uh, study, so we're just waiting on Caltrans at this point. C Carlos, just to um, clarify, we're funded for that phase for the project initiation or for PSNR? Uh, it's called PIED, but in the PIED, there's also a PSNR or a PDS. It's part of, of it. Phase. It's part of that okay. PIED. Okay, good. Thank you. Question for Carlos? Yeah. So when you're talking about a, a Garbani interchange, I mean, are you talking about a, a bridge and on and off ramps in both directions, or what exactly have you been talking to Caltrans about? Sure, it's a full on interchange. That's what's uh, identified in our general plan as okay. an interchange. And that's where we're going to approach Caltrans. Is there um, maybe a, a last exit <laughs> where where we might have the opportunity if they if they don't okay a full interchange, if we could just have an on and off ramp um, in each direction? So southbound, you have an on and off ramp. Northbound, you have an on and off ramp. It wouldn't be terribly cumbersome for people to navigate up to Holland and get over if they had to go over. But I'm just, you know, initially when I brought it up, a couple of years ago at the strategic visioning, it was just a, an extra place for people to get on and off the freeway. Right. Maybe not necessarily full on interchange. It might be an easier uh, shortfall uh, or uh, easier budget to reach. Right. Those are alternative to, uh, the alternatives that are looked at the uh, uh, PID phase. Um, full interchange on and off ramps, only overpass, or maybe a facing approach uh, where we do the overpass and then the on and off ramps. And it's all depending on the traffic studies that are developed in that phase. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. Um, the next item under infrastructure is the Welcome Mat program, and this is uh, this was added at last year's workshop, and it's the uh, landscaping beautification at the main quarters. Um, and I will hand it over to Jeff for an update. So on this project, we were just getting going on it. We did a reach out to Caltrans to. Uh, start to work with them on uh, beautifying some of the uh, interchange areas and our entrance and exits from the uh, city along the 215. Um, we are working with them currently. Um, just kind of give you an example, uh, some of the time frames that they told us as far as beautification, um, full beautification of intersections or interchanges. Uh, they represented that uh, Murrieta, who was doing a lot of work on some of their interchanges, it took them four to five years to actually get to the point of starting construction on some of their beautification. So it's a long process, but we've uh, initiated the process with Caltrans, and we're gonna be working diligently to not only move forward to that process, but also see if we can update some of the maintenance agreements for uh, better ongoing maintenance uh, along the uh, corridor and the interchange portions. That is what they told us, four to five years, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Weidman. Um, objective 4.8 is a northern and southern gateway development. Staff did revise some of these um, tasks and actions a bit. So right now the uh, tasks that are identified are to identify facilities, funding sources, partnerships with utility, and partnerships with utility providers. Um, and I'm not sure if Cheryl, um, Ms. Kitsaro will uh, provide an update. This, this is the item I was looking for earlier when we were talking about the, the northern and southern gateways. So I think based on the discussion under land use, perhaps we um, merge these or put these in both locations and really flesh out the, the previous discussion. Okay. And the last. Next, we have the Bradley Bridge uh, Road over Salt Creek project. Some of the key action items are the design, environmental, funding strategy, and construction. And I'll hand it over to Carlos once again. Thank you, Melda. So updates on Bradley Bridge. Um, plans are 100% completed. Uh, we'll have to do a, a revision to the plans based because of the Salt Creek Trail. Uh, the plans were completed before the Salt Creek Trail came in. 
Um, so a small revision. Uh, we are finalizing utility agreements with EMWD, um, and we are working on the, the funding strategy uh, to complete uh, the funds needed for this for this bridge. As you know, we received $2 million from flood control, and we have until fiscal year 23, um, 24 to spend that money. Uh, it's kind of a condition they put on us uh, to go ahead and use of those funds. Um, and that's the that's all the updates for Bradley Bridge. Okay, thank you, Carlos. And the last objective under infrastructure is a smart cities for infrastructure, um, and I believe that is was put on hold once COVID um, COVID hit. And I'll hand it over to our director uh, Cheryl Kitsaro once again. Thank you. Yes, you know, it's interesting. I just pulled up the, the RFP for the Smart City Strategic Plan. The city released that RFP on March 12th, 2020. <laughs> um, we got a couple proposals, um, but given the unknowns with COVID, the project was put on hold. Um, I think now having Ron joining the team is a, is a very important um, piece to uh, moving this project forward. We've talked about it. Um, we can uh, reissue the RFP so that we can um, go back and refocus on um, developing a smart city strategic plan. Some of the other things that we've already talked about um, in his first week here is, you know, looking at creating um, a broadband uh, plan. So we are also already doing our um, traffic signal interconnect. So there are things that we're also doing um, in terms of smart cities infrastructure, but the, the next step is really to get that RFP back out on the streets for the strategic plan. Okay. I think that brings us to the end, right, Imelda? Yes, and so now <coughs> it's time to discuss um, or add anything under the infrastructure area. All right, uh, first up is Councilman Dinas. Yes, um, on the smart cities, you know, now that we have our new IT director, um, it may be worthwhile to have a citywide IT assessment on things that, uh, just like the smart city, the broadband, uh, what the city can do for the residents and open data being more open and transparent with our budget. They can see that type of thing. You know, we, we're, and we're moving that direction already, but it'd be nice to do that as well as um, looking at our online permitting and that kind of thing, how we can improve it because th that's not going to go away even when the pandemic doesn't. It's still going, you know, I think uh, once you build it, they will come type of thing. And I think that it's, it's been uh, successful. I can see that continuing on, as well as our uh, internal IT needs. You know, there'd be cybersecurity. Uh, you know, what's the future of IT look like, and how can we use that within the city to improve our service to the residents? So, those type of thing I like to see as a, as a new, maybe separate item here on our our strategic plan, plan here. Um, okay. That. I agree. And, and you still got like two weeks left of the month to f figure it all out, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Dean. Uh, Councilman Carwin. Uh, Carlos, I had a question about the, uh, the Bradley Bridge. As far as the funding goes, where are we on that? How short are we, and what are the sources that we're looking to to fill that short, shortfall? Sure. Um, we've, um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, exact numbers, but we have about one and a half million dollars already allocated from previous fiscal years. Um, we have two million dollars from um, flood control. The total cost of the project is about 11 million dollars. So there you have it. <laughs> so we are quite a bit short. So is, is there a target as to where that money is supposed to come from? Sure, um, uh, DIF, development impact, impact fees, um, drainage, drainage DIFs, um, uh, traffic signal DIF, uh, measure A, uh, measure DD as well. Has there been a projection as to if all of those things work out, how long it would take to make another $8 million off of that, off of those sources? So if all the revenues work out as projected, uh, it would probably be another couple of years um, before we're fully funded. And is that 
Is that funding going into a separate account or is that just all going into the general fund and then when we're ready to build, we're ready to build? No, it's going to the separate account uh, specifically for Broadway Bridge. Uh, Rochelle is going to chime in. Good evening. I just wanted to add to that. As far as looking at the funding, we do um, look at all of the projects and prioritize the funding with the needs of the project. So I know we will be having a capital, um, a capital improvement project uh, workshop coming up soon, but it is looking at how critical the need is to the community and the, the funding sources that we have available in comparison to the other, the other projects on the list. So it is, you know, it's uncertain with the future diff coming in, um, but we can also look at other sources as they come up, such as development that would be in that community that could contribute to, um, towards it and so forth. So we're always looking at that. I just wanted to, to let you know, it's all, it, it is um, looking at the priorities and the funding, funding available um, as a total pr um, process in prioritizing the funding. Thank you. Go ahead. So to answer that question is, is um, we will have a, a, a CIP workshop. I think uh, it would be April 21st, right? April 21st. I'm looking at my notes, and and we we are going to be asking the council to help us with the schedule and the timing of that. Obviously, if we uh, decide to change the schedule on other projects, we could come up with the funding very fast. We are hoping also that we uh, can use Measure DD monies uh, as they become available for you know, funding year 22, 23, 24. Uh, and we're also knocking on every door uh, from the federal government to the state government to see if we can seek assistance. We did have a very productive meeting with Congressman Calvert, and that topic, this bridge continues to be the topic of conversation with him. Uh, he did, he appeared to be more interested in it this time around, and, and we did give him, provided him with a, with a lot of information. Uh, we talked to them about possibly about a four and a half million dollar subsidy from the federal government. So we're, we're trying to work every, every funding option that we have to be able to be a, a better positioned by 22-23 on that. And just to, for schedule purposes, the workshop is actually April 12th is what we put on the count, yes. Okay, other uh, thoughts, ideas, discussion? <clears throat> I did have one uh, question and this may end up, in fact, I got about six things that I want to bring to the April 12th workshop uh, for CIP. But this one is kind of a little different, and it has to do, it's a question about street lights. So we purchased street lights through that WRCOG program. Edison always installed them. Does the city at this point start installing street lights uh, that aren't, part of a developer's project. So if we've got a roadway that's there and it's kind of in a rural area and it's dark and there's a lot of traffic and we need to have three or four street lights installed, is it is it now our responsibility or does Edison still do that as a service to us? Can somebody help me out? Yeah, since we own the street lights, it's our responsibility. Uh, we'll of course work with Edison to bring in the power uh, to those street lights, but uh, so there's some coordination still with SCE, but ultimately it'll be our responsibility. Okay, so, so I, I can I can answer some of that, please. <clears throat> I've talked to Jeremy Goldman a little bit, and um, one of the things that they can do, and what I have in an email from him is that for free, if we wanted to, we could install mast arms on existing telephone poles. So if there's a telephone pole that has power and it just so happens to be in an area where it's dark, they can install a, a street light on that pole. Hmm. Um, there's a bunch of areas in my district where it's you know a lot of rural areas, but they are very dark. Yeah. Um, all up and down Marietta Road, there's stop signs and whatnot, but there's power poles everywhere. Okay. And um, you know, it used to be that you could just have, you'd see a, an arm attached to a power pole, and I asked Jeremy about it. He said, yeah, let's figure out a way and you know come up with a needs assessment, and if, if there's a way to do it, then we can definitely help you do that. That's interesting. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of uh, input from the public talking about how Menifee Road uh, north of Scott is now 
uh, very busy because Whitewood's now punched through in Murrieta, and so a lot of people are taking that north and south route, and that's a rural area, and it's very dark at night. So people have been saying, hey, Mayor, now that we own the streetlights, is it, is it our responsibility, and can we put lights there? And I talked to Councilman Dinas about uh, some of those areas up there in Romaland, Watson, Trade Winds, what are some of those other streets, Palomar, and it, man, you can't hardly see your hand in front of your face uh, when the moon's not out. So uh, I think it's also a public safety issue as well to have those uh, neighborhoods illuminated. So. I just was curious now that it's ours. I don't I don't remember us discussing that back when we were doing the streetlight purchase program about is it now going to be our responsibility? So I'm um, just looking for some education. But I thank you for for telling me what Jeremy said. Yeah, I was I was specific guy eyeballing um, um, Holland and Evans. Uh, there was a fatal accident there a couple of months ago that had nothing to do with the dark, but it's a very dark corner. Yeah. Um, the entire stretch of myriad of uh, Newport Road across the street from Quesa Nacero Center, there's no lights on the south side of the road. So when you're driving through there in the dark, you can't see anything if there's pedestrians walking along the side of, south, of Scott Road. Yeah. There, there's a lot of spots like that. You'd be surprised when you're driving around and you're all these little dark patches everywhere. I'll tell you, I've been seeing uh, a lot of advertisements if you're on social media for those solar powered LED lights that you can just be attached to a wall or attached to a pole that illuminate an area pretty well too and i know uh, our parks team bryce uh, has been putting those at some of the parks and uh, in some of the mailbox cluster areas that we've been having some troubles in so that could be a, a better solution than having to you know go through the engineering of designing and running utilities and all that so all right um one other thing is i want to just kind of bring this up and it has to do with the temporary use of the recently purchased property in sun city the old king's inn property and uh, i know gina has some ideas about like some pop-up food locations there uh, where we could have something kind of fun imagine some overhead lighting and <laughs> and uh, vendors come maybe they're even food trucks and um and maybe we have other things next to it, like a craft fair or farmer's fair and those kinds of things. I just don't want that property to be purchased and sit there stagnant and not have us do anything. The idea was uh, to be able to uh, utilize the site. And and so if that's something that we can encourage staff to um, do sooner than later, if that's something that we're able to do, I think the public <clears throat> would appreciate it. And we've been talking about Cherry Hills Plaza and how do we put a little bit of energy there and I think something like that would uh, bring people from out of town to come and see something different and experiencing uh, maybe each weekend we have a different set of food vendors or something and keep it interesting so um, it's just an idea if, if tonight's idea night I'm throwing out some ideas <laughs> and I have a few other I wanted to ask Carlos about the um, highway safety program those Caltrans funded and it looks like there's quite a few that are on the list. They were put as priority ones, hoping that we could get some funds. Can you give us an update on where we are with those? Are we still pursuing those? We are pursuing funds. Uh, we recently uh, submitted eight applications for the Cycle 10 uh, program, and we are waiting to hear back from them. Uh, we should have an answer in the next couple of weeks because they're, they're due uh, this month. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, we, we continuously pursue grant funds for those projects. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. I hope it works. Any idea what the long-range vision for that property is? For, you're King, for Kings Inn? I mean, we, you're talking about Kings Inn? We, we don't know what we want to do with it. It's a, going to be something that the city uses. It could be a... Um, future mock, I guess, uh, you know, maintenance operations or... But in the meantime, let's say that's two years from now or five or ten years from now, instead of, instead of it being a field with weeds and a fence around it, let's let's use it. And the beauty of something like that pop-up is it's easily put up and it's easily taken down when we're ready to actually do something with the property. But in the meantime, let's take advantage of it. It's ours now. We're not waiting on private industry to do something. It's something we can do. We may even be able to make a little money. Those vendors sometimes will pay you big bucks if they've... Uh, are making some money themselves. So, so, so a question I have that this was a this will be a discussion for another time. But I worry about the restaurants that are already there, and taken away from those. So I I can see this could go 
South, unintended consequences. <laughs> sure. <laughs> definitely a, a conversation we can have later on. Yeah. That was one of my first thoughts. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. If we bring in a thousand people from out of town, it could end up being a, a real shot in the arm for all of our businesses that are there. They may love it. Yeah, there used to be a farmer's market there at, at the chair. At, Mm -hmm. at the, there you know and that they stopped doing that and it was nice for the residents of sun city to be able to go there and and do some shopping and get fresh vegetables and stuff like that so it'd be great to see something like that for the residents there on uh you know, I agree. on and off again one other thing um and this one's for jonathan nix has to do with you know the county just did us a great favor of putting in the salt creek trail and there's a lot of people that are saying where can we park Where's the staging area? Where? Why is it unsafe along the road for me to unload my bikes? Can we get horses onto the trail? Where would we unload them? So if that could be something that's in a future thing for the city to uh, take a look at uh, opportunities along the trail to see if we can create those places for the public and make it easy on them. Yes, we are looking into that, and we'll add it to the list. Okay, thanks. Other ideas, council members? I think we're at the end. Imelda, did you have anything else you want to wrap it up with? Um, let's see. Just making sure I received all the ideas um, or the suggestions, the citywide IT assessment, including internal IT needs and cybersecurity. I'm looking at street lights in rural dark areas um, for the city to install those lights. Temporary use of the recently purchased lot in Sun City. Um, some ideas were vendors or food trucks, farmers fair, et cetera. Um, as well as looking at opportunities for parking or uses of, um, or for um, space for the horses on Salt Creek tra Trail. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, staging area for Staging for area, horses. yes. And I got a big long list, but I'm going to save them until uh, April the 12th. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I think we're there. Yes. Uh, Madam Clerk, did we have any public comments oh. that have come in during the There's meeting? Still, there's this a couple keeps going. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, like we're, 10 we're more pages. <laughs> sorry. I thought you meant infrastructure. Yes, that was the big one. I'm sorry. You're right. There's community outreach. I'm yes, sorry. Yes, there's community outreach and workforce and facilities uh, management, but those are, um, they'll be um, not as long. Um, okay, so community outreach. Um, so objective 5.1, um, it is to partner with MSJC. Um, we currently do partner with MSJC. The only outstanding item is to execute an MOU outlining the partnership, and that is expected to be um, completed in July 2021. Again, with COVID, that kind of delayed the process. And uh, John, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. Uh, no, we, um, as the mayor knows, we have a community cl uh, collaboration meeting with MSJC every quarter. I uh, partner with um, Vice President Jeremy Brown over there to host that meeting. The mayor regularly attends. And um, the, the um, both uh, Vice uh, Vice President Brown and President Schultz are very interested in partnering with the city, especially with all the new facilities that are going into MSJC. You know, they're going to have that nice football stadium, and they're interested in not only using it for their sports programs, but using it for community events. It's going to be a very nice amenity for the city. So that and other economic development partnerships, uh, workforce development. Um, so myself, Gina, and Dominique have um, been actively working with MSJC on that, and I'm going to hand it over to Gina. I would just like to bring up that recent discussions as early as of last week, Roger Schultz said that we should be commended as a city as a model partner for the college. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. And um, item 5.2, social media increased presence. Um, we The last um, item I believe on there is the um, to develop the social media policy. Um, we do have our Austin PIO on board now. She is working on it, and that is expected to be completed in June 2021. Um, next is the public information officer. That has been a completed item. We did um, hire Ms. Uh, Dominique Samario. Um, our community education outreach. That is also um, completed and ongoing. And um, as discussed earlier, we did add the um, Create Healthcare Medical Partnerships and the Public Records Open Access and Public Transparency Objectives at the last um, workshop. Some key action items under the Healthcare Medical Partnerships are to execute MOUs. Uh, staff has identified partners. 
Um, and under the public records, open access and public transparency, most of those items have already been completed. The only outstanding ones are the out, uh, online records lookup and the Axella Citizens Access Online. Oh, was that finished? Oh, that is completed. Um, so we are on track with those. I don't know if staff wanted to add anything on either of those objectives. No? Okay. Um, and so I think, and so that concludes the community outreach. At this time, we're open for discussion and recommendations. Anything on that topic? I think we can go to the next I, one. I just oh. have one, th one thing here. I know town halls are on hold right now, but as we do go back to our events, whether it would be nice, and I don't know if it's possible, but something we have time to think about it now anyways, is to have some kind of a city information tent or area there where res residents can go and talk to city staff. Hey, you know, how's, you know, what's the latest with the police department? You know, what's the latest, you know, when is my, my road going to get repaved? When, you know, what kind of development's coming and have, you know, different maps and, and pictures or whatever they can to just go in there and, and be, get information about what's going on. And, um, I mean, that's at the really 10,000 foot level, what, we, what can be done, but something along that line. So, you know, so, so that we're educating as long as, as, as well as, you know, allowing our residents to have fun activities and stuff. But they may have a question as they're walking around and stuff, and then go inside and look around and, and ask some questions. If, you know, if we don't have the answer at the moment, you know, we can get their email or whatever and then get back to them. Councilmember Dinas, we absolutely do uh, do that. Actually, Imelda usually um, uh, champions that booth. Um, and we also try to take advantage if we're moving something forward, like the alternative transportation program, for example, we'll have a specific booth um, for that. But definitely we'll uh, keep that on the radar and continue to do that once we're planning our events and add more information uh, when possible. We'll have our police department there, our fire department there as usual. All right, let's go to workforce and facilities. Okay, so the last um, goal area is the workforce and facilities uh, management. And um, so as you can see on this slide, uh, workspace, staffing, updated, update technology, those are ongoing um, items. And I believe I will hand it over to our assistant city manager. Just a brief comment, don't really uh, have much more than we're pretty much filled out on this, this, on this building here, which is why we're moving forward with the uh, needs assessment for the permanent city hall uh, over in the town center. Okay. And just a quick note on the uh, technology, some of the um, some of the equipment that's been and software that's been um, implemented is Excella, Laserfish, new computers. We, uh, staff receive laptops, Bluebeam, QList, um, new AV equipment in the uh, chambers, and uh, peg funds to be used soon. Um, and maintenance equipment, that is also an ongoing item. Um, this includes items such as the backhoe, road grader, case backhoe, and other equipment, equipment needed for the future. And the screening at the maintenance building, that is almost completed. I believe that's April 2021. Yes, so that's on track to be completed next month. Um, so I think that concludes that section. Are there any items or uh, recommendations or discussion on workforce and facilities management. Armando. Yeah, Mayor, just a, a point of clarification. I did have a chance to visit uh, with the public works manager at the facility, and it's not 100% complete, but they are moving ahead with building uh, one of those temporary steel structures to be able to house a lot of the material there that, that it's unsightly right now. So in, in the next month and a half or two, I guess the rain really stopped them from keep going. They're, they're going to be finishing up there, and we're hoping to move all that stuff that's visible to that to those facilities. And we hope that that helps with the aesthetics. But we wanted to make sure that we develop a cost-effective plan and not have to spend too much money uh, at that facility uh, in anticipation of our, our future ultimate maintenance facility building that we hope to start working on. Okay, thanks. I noticed the cement's all in and all the way around in the back. I did see the framing for the steel building, so looks good. I saw the cypress trees. Yep. 
Hopefully they maybe in 30 years nice warm and they grow fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for the update. Um, okay, at this time we can take any recommendations for the workforce and facilities management, or if none, I can move forward. I don't hear any on that. Okay, um, so with that, we wanted to um, at this time uh, we wanted I wanted to end the presentation with the team philosophy, Menifee philosophy, we are building a safe, thriving, and premier place to be. And um, be, I did want to show you all a quick um, preview of what we're doing with OpenGov and the strategic visioning plan. But before we get there, at this time we can take any additional questions or recommendations or any new additions to the plan that you would like to, um, that you would like to implement. I did want to note that when you look at this worksheet, it has the columns, um, it has goals, objectives, point of contact, Etc. Uh, staff will be looking at that goals category because we our goals are the four we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, safe and attractive community. So when we look at the um, implementation plan, it's kind of confusing when you see the goal areas or goal categories listed as goals. So we be, we will be looking at that as well, just to reword that a bit, just to um, differentiate the two. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I um, Imelda, before you go on, I do know that there is a public commenter, and okay. so I think we should probably take that real quick, and then we can. Um, yes, Your Honor. The um, request to speak comes from Rick Croy, and I believe IT is going to plug him in. Okay. Rick, can you hear us? Commissioner Croy? You may have gave up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't believe we have emailed comments. Let me just check with staff. Well, while we're trying to get him, Imelda, did you have anything else you wanted to yes. share? Um, yes, I wanted to just share what we're doing with, um, as you are aware, we're using OpenGov for our budget process this year, but we also took the opportunity to use it to implement uh, our strategic visioning plan and eventually use it as a uh, public uh, portal where the public can log into our website and they can use it as an interactive tool. Um, right now, it is only accessible to certain staff internally as we're working through it. Um, but I did want to give the council a sneak peek of it. And if IT can show my screen, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay. It's exciting, I promise. <laughs> right? <laughs> just thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if I can move this, but I know I don't know if they can move the talking box. Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay, and I'll just give a brief overview um, because it is um, a lot, and I won't go into each of the each of the areas. But uh, staff has been working on the strategic visioning plan and with uh, working with OpenGov to make this uh, available to the public eventually. Um, and first, of course, to uh, staff. Um, so we took the document that we have, the PDF document, and we uh, basically took that verbiage and placed it as an introduction to the front page. And so when users log in, they'll be able to go to this page and they can, if they wanna just access the goals right away, they can just click on these icons or on these links and it'll take them immediately to a page that opens up each a goal area and objective. So as you can see, we have our four, four goals, safe and attractive community, livable and economically prosperous community, responsive and transparent community government, and our accessible and interconnected community. 
Um, and staff data work with our PIO to come up with these cool icons, which will also be implemented in our budget document for the next fiscal year. And so here, um, users will be able to click here to look at the, again, the quick, uh, the goal areas and objectives, or they can come back down here to learn more about the different areas in the plan. So if you click on executive summary, it'll give um, the users a quick um, view of what our executive summary looks like. And there's our awesome executive team. We have our, our mission statement embedded as well. Then they can also look at the Menifee vision with our wonderful uh, city council. <laughs> yes, our awesome city council, <laughs> um, definitely. And uh, here it defines the goals, objectives, and actions. And again, this is all verbiage taken from the uh, adopted plan in 2018. Um, then if they choose to, they can go and see uh, our community values. And here you can see all the different values that were adopted as part of the plan, small town atmosphere, employment, circulation, balanced growth, natural resources, growth opportunities, recreation, town center, urban core, public services, and infrastructure. And it goes on to um, staff values, which we see on some of our uh, word walls. We're one team, we value integrity, customer service, leadership, and we are professional. And here's um, our amazing um, staff and city manager giving a presentation. Oh, awesome, yes. Um, and then uh, we can go do uh, Menifee's growth. And actually, if you click on this, it takes you to the economic development um, webpage. And actually, when I had the um, Menifee vision with city council, if you click on your picture, it takes them to the city council webpage as well. So all these pictures and any verbiage on here, it can be linked to, to other areas, which is pretty cool. Great. Yes. Yes. And then um, if somebody wants to just look at a quick update, this is basically what I went over today. All the uh, updates that we went over today, the um, added tasks and actions that took place at the last workshop and everything that's been completed to date within the last year. Um, and then here you can just see a quick glance of what's completed under each goal area, um, what's completed ongoing, what's in process, what's on hold, et cetera. And it gives different uh, visuals, different charts that you can look at. Um, and you can break it out into in process tasks. If somebody just wants to see what's in process under each and, and what objective it applies to. Um, all the on hold tasks, and this can be modified with however we want, with however we want to, um, whatever information we want to show. Um, and these are the completed goals by um, each goal category. And then just the last area I wanna show you, so you go to the goal area and objectives, this is where we go into, where. Um, you can see each of the different categories, public safety, land use, city hall, infrastructure, uh, community outreach, and this actually links to our Menifee Matters, and um, workforce and facilities management. Um, and as you can see, just scrolling quickly back up, it gives you a brief um, overview of where all the different tasks are. Blue is um, completed and um, orange is in process. Um, and you can go further by clicking into each of these goal areas and it'll tell you how much of each category is completed. It gives you a chart you can look at again, completed, in process. Um, you, and it gives you a snapshot of everything that's in process. If you just wanna see the task real quick, what's, what's outstanding, you can just come here. Um, and just, dif yes, different visuals, a completed task, et cetera. So I just wanted to show that this to the council that we are working on this. It's about 95% done. It'll be updated periodically. And the cool thing is, um, like I said, you can uh, link it to other areas in our website or you can link it to uh, different pictures. Um, and then I also have a link here to the actual document if if residents just wanna go ahead and just read the document. 
Um, and we will be updating some of the pictures that are on the current one. So just wanted to show that to you, Council. Um, it is exciting, um, trying to make it as user-friendly as possible and as transparent as possible for the community and for um, staff. Imelda, did you put all that together? Myself and other staff, yes. Okay. <laughs> staff. Fabulous. Because it's a lot of information. Yeah. And now we all know who to go to when we have... <laughs> Where yes. Are we with yes. <laughs> Fabulous work there. Okay. Yeah. Great Thank you. Job. Appreciate it. It was a team effort, but we do want to um, just um, be able to update it as we go along. Just you know, periodically update with photos and links and information, but also, as I mentioned before, make it uh, available to the public as a transparency tool as well. Well, it would be great. Also, I can see for those coming here to invest in our community. It's, it will be a great tool. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. I see Rick Croy's daughter on the screen. Does that mean Rick's his with us? His granddaughter, I mean. Rick, can you hear us? Um, there's still issues, but uh, staff does have his comment available to read. Okay. We can have Stephanie read his comment. All right. <clears throat> How about I just read his comment? <laughs> um, it's right here. Good afternoon. In reading the documents, I believe a couple of priorities stand out. First, this first is to make sure our high-speed internet infrastructure is made the best in the area. With so many people and industries telecommuting, we should ensure this new market and labor segment is addressed. Second, Menifee should prioritize getting control of parks on the east side of the 215. To still have them bifurcated is no longer bifurcated no longer is either cost effective nor wise. We need this final phase of local control and can do a better job and for less cost to the taxpayers. Thank you, Rick Croy. All right, we appreciate his comments. Any others in the queue or emailed? No other comments. All right, thank you, uh, Sarah. Council members, anything else before we adjourn? I think right. I think it's great. I, you know, thank you everybody for being here. And, yeah, um, it's a little bit of a different format. You're used to having a a moderator, and this is more like a um, a little more intense. But I think it's been good. Yeah, no, it's a great opportunity too. Thank you, thank you all. I I want to thank our staff. I mean, for the amazing work. I'm yep. looking. This is this is great. Um. <laughs> well, Imelda, please take it back to your yes. team and just say how much the council appreciated it because we do appreciate the work that's been done. That's, yeah. So, yeah, it's great. All right, with that, thanks everybody. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>